Thank you for that, for that introduction and I'm glad it doesn't take too much time because John is very worried because I have seven, 78 slides and 30 minutes. So you can, you can just calculate how fast it should go. So first of all, sorry for some people that have already seen some of these slides. Um, but I mean the whole audience is quite diverse. So I have to reiterate a lot of the slides that some of the students from, for example, John's group have already seen before. So this is Maastricht. By now you wouldn't recognize it because there's about six or seven buildings surrounding it. This is an old picture. So it's been expanding a lot over the last few years and it's now 25 years that that building has been standing there. Um, my group mainly works on skeletal muscle tissue. And what we like to assess from a metabolic but also structural perspective, the dynamics of skeletal muscle tissue. And that is something that we don't always realize, that muscle tissue is dynamic in nature. It's constantly being synthesized and broken down. And now, I think at least 10 people know what I always ask people, is to just look at your own arm. Just uh, lift up your sleeve. Don't look at my arm, just look at your own arm. Just do it, because then you'll remember it. Just look at your own arm. Make, make, make a fist, and I look at the, at the muscle under your skin. Three months from now, two to three months from now, new arm. You have completely broken down that arm again and build it up again. So what we don't realize is that tissues continuously turn over. Constant synthesis and, and breakdown. And I've been working on muscle, and muscle shows you a breakdown and a synthesis at a rate of 1 to 2% per day. So in 50 to 100 days, you have completely remodeled your muscle. Brought it all down, broken it down to individual amino acids and built it up again. And you used old parts to build new parts. So it's a continuous turnover. Now we've also started measuring the same thing in organs. If I show you those data, it's even more astounding. We've just recently, and I was talking to, to, to John about it, and I haven't actually told anybody yet, so now that I've told John, and the half the world will probably know it anyway, so <laughs> i just as well tell you guys, is we've, we've also measured human brain. So we took brain tissue during surgery after seven hours of tracer in, infusions, and we could actually assess brain turnover in vivo in humans. And that's about three to four percent per day. So within six, six weeks, you have a new brain. So it's really fun to be here at ACU and saying like, I was writing down something that I revised a little bit in the plane. I wrote, maybe this will also spark the debate on what is the uh, biological basis of the soul. And I wrote it, I, I thought that maybe I should revise it, so I said the basis of, of personality and ego. Uh, maybe that go, go, goes down better with the, with the scientists. But it's really funny that you see you have a new brain in six weeks. You still have all your data still on there. That's remarkable if you think of it like that. I mean, we're looking at tumors, we're looking at pancreas, we're looking at liver, and so everything turns, turns over. But we won't go into detail on that. I'll just show you data on muscle. And the fact that we have that turnover rate is interesting and is also very practical because that allows us to recondition skeletal muscle tissue like you see here. The endurance athlete on the left, the resistance type athlete on the right, they are able to recondition the muscle to become a better athlete. And yes, the guy on the right was doing a lot more than just nutrition and exercise, but the guy on the left was doing also a lot of other things than just exercise and nutrition, so that's the same. But all of you are, are able to recondition your muscle towards its use, kind of sports, kind of physical activity, kind of labor work that you do. Of course, we also have adaptation to less favorable changes in our lifestyle. Our TVs are still getting thinner, but we unfortunately are still getting more obese. And we also adapt to that. And we already had a discussion about crosstalk between organs. We know that we get deconditioned muscle in the various states, like for example, with immobilization. Who has broken an arm or a leg here? Very safe audience. First thing that, that happens, your complaint, what is it? When you get a cast, itch, you get an itch, you start to take a knitting needle, you stick it in there, try to scratch a bit, and then after four or five days, you can actually slip your whole hand in there and scratch. That's muscle atrophy. That's the muscle disappearing. If you don't use it, you decondition the muscle, you recondition to less physical activity, and the muscle simply disappears. So that's immobilization. We also have muscle loss when we become older. Then we call it sarcopenia, the loss of muscle mass with aging. 
And in a lot of disease states, we have an accelerated loss of muscle. So it's some sort of accelerated aging. We see that in cancer cachexia, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, type 2 diabetes, which is an interesting one because if you lose muscle, you lose the capacity to take up glucose and you become more insulin resistant. Now, if you become insulin resistant, you seem to lose more muscle per unit of time as you age, further developing insulin resistance. So it's a downward spiral. It's a double whammy. And then there are cardiovascular disease, and we can have the discussion on the heart as an exocrine organ, but with a lot of the heart disease, we also see massive muscle loss. And it doesn't seem to be only loss of physical activity. There's also a lot of interaction there. So the big question, and it's a question that I haven't answered, and I hope many of you will try to answer it, but this will actually take a few lifetimes, is what regulates muscle maintenance? Now, one of the reasons, or one of the things that we believe nowadays, is that muscle maintenance is regulated mostly on the synthesis side. That is also because we can measure synthesis, and we're pretty poor in actually measuring protein breakdown. But it seems that there's anabolic stimuli that we encounter every day that allow us to maintain muscle. And if one of those two stimuli falls away, we rapidly lose muscle. Now, it's obvious that the first one is, of course, nutrition. Nutrition is a direct anabolic stimulus. As soon as we eat, the protein in our diet directly stimulates muscle protein synthesis. It's the amino acids that don't only work as building blocks for new muscle and new tissues, but they also act as signaling molecules. They directly stimulate protein synthesis. As soon as you eat protein, the amino acids in your circulation see the muscle, and then they set off all these signaling pathways. And they set off all the muscle protein synthesis. So you need the building blocks, but you also need the stimulatory aspects of the amino acids. Now, we've talked about cell models, animal models, knockout models, and whole body physiology. Of course, if we're doing physiology, we like to keep it simple, but it's so complicated because we have all these organs interplaying on endpoint parameters in a cell, in a single cell. So what about muscle protein synthesis after a meal? It's regulated on the following levels. First of all, you have protein digestion. If you don't digest your protein, those amino acids are never going to be seen by the muscle. So that's the first level of control. And that involves, of course, eating, even the position in which you eat, um, the amount of acid in your stomach, uptake in the gut, digestion in the gut. Then you have your amino acid absorption. Only 50% of the protein you ingest is released in the circulation. The other 50% is, is used by the gut to recondition the road tissue. You have a new intestine by about one to two days. It's remarkable if you see the turnover of your, of your intestinal tissues. So the plasma amino acid availability, that's only 50% of what you eat. That becomes available in circulation. And if your hormonal response to a meal with a nice stimula stimulatory response from your insulin aspects, they open up the vascular beds and then the blood actually reaches the muscle. Now when it reaches the muscle, your postprandial perfusion, those amino acids can be taken up by muscle and then you get your stimula stimulatory effects on your muscle protein signaling pathways. And of course, you can do all the signaling that you want, but if you signal and you stimulate protein synthesis, but you don't have the building blocks at the same time, you're not going to have a stimulation, a stimulation of muscle protein synthesis. So it's also an orchestrated comparison, and that's the discussion we will and I have, that the signaling and the building blocks availability have to be on the right moment, the right time, to maximize the responses. And then you have myofibular protein. Now there's researchers and there's whole research groups working on all these different levels, but it's difficult to take all these levels uh, along in one single research study. Now, what can you do in order to assess muscle protein synthesis? You can infuse labeled amino acids. Amino acids with a little flag, and you can infuse them, take blood samples, see how many of the amino acids in the blood are actually labeled. Generally, we use 10%. And then we take muscle biopsies repeatedly and see how much of those amino acids are taken up and incorporated into, for example, muscle protein. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't give you full insight on all these different levels. In order to do so, you have to get those labeled amino acids in your food. Now, unfortunately, you can't buy those labeled amino acids in food. So if you want to incorporate them in food, you have to do it yourself. So we needed some help. So we had the help of this girl. And this is Apple. And we infused the Apple with 40,000 euros worth of tracer. 
And this study, what I'm now going to show you, cost about 400,000 euros. Um, and it's actually to made the whole money was spent to make a study simple. Sometimes the most easiest questions or the simplest questions are actually the most difficult to answer. So what we did is we infused Tracer in cows. We milked the cows, got the milk, we can extract the proteins, we can even modulate the proteins, etc. Then we give them in human experiments. Because we also use an intravenous tracer with a different label, we can see how much of the ingested protein is really released to the circulation. And because the label enrichment is so high, we can even see how much of what you just ate is actually incorporated in muscle within a few hours. So that sounds simple, but it takes a lot of people and a lot of instruments. And this is uh, Tim doing one of the many studies that we've done, and this is the most quantitative of all. Here he's still holding his thumb up. I think afterwards when he had all the catalysts in, he was a lot less happy. But what we did is we gave Tim 20 grams of protein, took blood samples, infused another tracer intravenously, then also measured AV balance over the leg, put catalysts in his artery, in his leg, and in the vein, and we took muscle biopsies. Now, funny enough, what you see is this is textbook work, has been published way often. Simply when you ingest protein, you see an increase in protein synthesis within two hours, and it's maintained for up to five hours. What was fun about this study is we could actually show that about 50% of the protein is released in the circulation, only 50%. Of that 50%, about 10% is built into muscle protein within five hours. So from the 20 grams of protein, about 2.1 grams is muscle within six hours. So yes, your mom was right. You are what you eat. In fact, you are what you just ate. So I'm not sure what you had for breakfast, but that's now you. And that's pretty remarkable if you look at it that way. And that's also why we use this title for, for science, a science paper, just in, to get people to explain or to actually get them the attention that what you eat should be in your mind, that that will become you, so maybe you pay more attention to what you're eating. That could be milk, that could be beef. We could have a whole discussion on what modulates the postprandial protein synthesis. We've worked with different proteins, digestion and absorption kinetics. And we won't get into detail, detail on that, but of course a lot of work has been done in meat and milk because they're animal-based proteins, but there's so many other things to, this, to develop. Of course, uh, plant-based proteins, uh, especially in third world countries, about 70 to 80 percent of their protein intake is coming from plant-based sources. So how do they stimulate protein synthesis? Of course, a lot of textbooks will tell you that it doesn't work. That is all based on, on soy because there's hardly any data on plant-based proteins. Some athletes, I mean, you know the jocks that come to you and say like, hey, we got plant-based proteins, but you can't get big on plant-based proteins. I said, you can get actually big on, on grass. I mean, this animal was actually getting this big. So yes, plant-based proteins also have a function in your food and they can stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Maybe not at the same efficiency, but it does. And so you can look at soy, or you can look at wheat, or you can look at alternative protein sources. At this moment, we're actually looking at a lot of insects and seeing whether the proteins derived from insects, which are easy to breed, they have a very high feed uh, tissue conversion efficiency, and you can use them to feed the world. And of course, for Western societies, we think that this is disgusting. But in a lot of uh, other uh, cultures, actually the protein intake comes from a very high percentage from insects. And this is the future, and a lot of factories in our Western civilizations are actually now producing uh, insect proteins and using that for, for future products. I never, expect, I never expected to infuse cows. Uh, I never expected to actually uh, write down these things in papers. I didn't even know what the names were, so I put the pictures on top so I could actually know what they are. But, <laughs> but there's a lot of things that we can do now, and uh, we're now making intrinsically labeled insect proteins, for example. But it's very difficult to put the catalyst in, in an ant. But we're trying there. Um, so this, this, is, this is the nutrition part. So that's the effects of nutrition on postprandial protein synthesis. But the other stimulus on protein synthesis is, of course, physical activity. Now, physical activity comes in many sizes, whether it's ADL activities like gardening or shopping, but also specific types of sports, endurance or resistance type exercise, with different phenotypic results and also different sets of proteins being expressed to a, expressed to a great extent. Now, who works on, uh, on nutrition? 
here. Who works on exercise? I only see about three people that lifted their hands twice. Only those people are right. The rest has to go back to the office, think about stuff, and then come back. You can't, I mean, tomorrow at the debate, we'll say something completely different probably, but there is no such thing as studying nutrition without studying physical activity, and there's no such thing as studying physical activity without nutrition. Because the two have a synergy, and you can't differentiate between the two completely, especially not in humans. So if you eat protein, it's what you see in here, then more study, you actually see protein synthesis go up with maximum levels of protein synthesis three hours after a meal and then it goes down again. And you have this with each meal allowing you to maintain muscle. So you actually, in three months from now, you think that that was a stupid story that the guy told me because my arm still looks the same. That is simply because you kept eating and exercising. If you stop with either one of those, you'll, you'll know that I'm right. Now, what happens if you do some physical activity before you eat? you see a greater stimulation of muscle protein synthesis that is also sustained over a more prolonged period of time. So physical activity or exercise makes the muscle more sensitive to the anabolic properties of amino acids. Simply, if you eat, the response is bigger if you actually do some physical activity. In another way, with the intrinsically labeled protein, same study basically, we gave young and healthy older people 20 grams of that protein that was intrinsically labeled, and then we saw how much was converted to muscle within six hours. Now, what happens if you do some physical activity before you eat? You actually see that about 20% more of the ingested protein is converted to muscle. So for those of you interested in more clinical aspects, don't feed people when they're lying in bed because you're worried about how much protein they get, but if they're lying in bed, they won't use the protein as efficiently. So have people eat dinner or breakfast on a table. Help them get out of bed. Anything in the bed. It's the same in Australia as it is in Europe. What happens? Where's the TV in a, in a room in the hospital? Where is it? Exactly. Uh, actually on top of the bed. So everybody lies on bed all day. About 85%, even the people not being sick, spend their time in the bed. It's the worst thing you can do. So nowadays, hospitals are now finding ways to get people to just simply go to a table and eat. We've done now studies to show you that you eat lying down, that simply the body position determines the digestion and absorption and postprandial protein synthesis. So I spent, I mean, it's a bit uh, uh, demoralizing, I spent 25 million euros in research money over the last 20 years to figure out and to provide clinical evidence that my mom was right. You have to eat three times a day, eat plenty of protein, be physical activity, chew well when you eat and sit upright. And maybe have some milk before going to bed. <laughs> Scary, but true. So physical activity prior to food intake makes you simply more of what you just ate. So if you remember those two things, I'm already happy. You are what you just ate, and if you perform some physical activity, you become more of what you just ate. So then food becomes even more effective and important. So now, what happens when we get this deconditioning? I don't have to tell you that the loss of muscle is predictive for almost all comorbidities and also mortality. So prevention of muscle loss is essential, so we need to figure out is what is causing the muscle loss. Now, that is anabolic resistance, and that's the title of this presentation. Studies, Mike Rennie. Um, Mike Rennie was one of the first to actually come with that title infusing or providing people with essential amino acids in a clamped condition, and they saw that, well, young people, when you give them essential amino acids, you see an increase in muscle protein synthesis with about 10 grams of essential amino acids, so about 20 grams protein, maximal response. If you do the same thing with all the people, you see that the stimulation of muscle protein synthesis is blunted. So there's a less anabolic response to feeding, and that's what they called anabolic resistance. And we see it in almost every disease state where there's also muscle atrophy. Now, it took us about five years to, con to actually confirm those data in a more physiological condition after a meal. So not a clamped condition, but a normal meal where you also have an insulin response and everything. But what you see here, young people, older people, relative healthy older people, we see that basal protein synthesis isn't, isn't different between the young and the elderly, but the anabolic response to feeding 20 grams of protein is greater in young versus elderly. So older people are not as effective in responding to a meal with a stimulation of protein synthesis. 
So that's the concept of anabolic resistance. Now, what causes anabolic resistance? Now, one of the first things is that we had all these discussions about physical activity making the muscle more sensitive. So, how is it that maybe aging is simply an effect of less physical activity making the muscle less sensitive? So that concept was basically two different fields, clinical, exercise, and both fields can learn so much from each other, but a lot of people are working only in one of the two fields. And that's the nice thing when people work both in exercise as well as more in clinical uh, studies. And that's why we came up with this, uh, this is a, a beer-driven title. Uh, we wanted just to say that anabolic resistance is maybe just a, a fake name for something. It should, should be called reduced physical activity or inactivity. So maybe a decline in physical activity causes anabolic resistance and is mainly the reason for the age-related muscle loss. So in order to investigate that, we started with a lot of lag immobilization and bed rest studies. So if you go to Maastricht, you see a lot of students walking around with a, with a cast, and then you think they've broken the leg. No, they participate in our studies. We cast them in, and we take muscle biopsies, and we do all these studies. And they, they I mean, you think like we're paying them a lot of money. No, but they, cho they can choose the color of their cast. <laughs> and that's why they actually keep coming. So what happens? Only one or two weeks of lag immobilization strongly reduces the anabolic sensitivity. So what you see here is after only, this is two weeks, 30% reduction in anabolic response to feeding. Much greater than we see if we compare a 20-year-old and an 80-year-old. So simply two weeks of local immobilization induces a severe case of anabolic resistance. So it's highly likely that any reduction in physical activity that is associated with more clinical conditions or simply aging is causing this anabolic resistance. It's not hormonal state in normal cases in healthy people because here it's very local. You have one lag versus the other lag. And the other lag doesn't show the anabolic resistance. So a decline in physical activity makes you less of what you just ate. So that it basically uh, concludes the whole lecture. You are what you just ate. If you perform physical activity, you become more of what you just ate. If you stop there being physical activity because you're hospitalized, you actually become less of what you just ate. Now, those three things, you can actually solve most physiological questions. Now, what is the clinical relevance of all of this? Because these are nerd studies. We're in a good fund to understand, but what do they mean and how can we use them in practice? It simply means that if we have older people, we can make their muscle more sensitive to the anabolic properties of amino acids, and we can simply increase muscle mass and strength. We can increase endurance capacity, and all of these things improve functional capacity, allowing them to actually become more active. So intervention studies to do this are successful, and they are usually successful, and they're even more successful when your starting point is lower. So the more sedentary, you will benefit more than the more active. And in contrast to a lot of the popular media, there are no non-responders. I don't know why in science now we have those non-responders or less responders. Now, most of you have medical training or research training. If you have a group of 15 people and you have a hypothesis, yes or no, you actually use that group to, d to define and answer your hypothesis. You can't go back and take the data from one person out and then say this guy is responding or not responding. If you want to say something about one single subject, you have to measure that same person 15 times and do your stats on that. You can't take single data. I mean, that is not science. So there are no non-responders. We look back at all the data we had. Everybody responded at some point in time. Or when they didn't respond, didn't respond. They didn't show positive data on increasing strength on one exercise. They did show it on the other exercise. There was not a single person that didn't respond if you actually took everything together. From a performance, but also from a muscle mass perspective. But what we do know is we can maximize the response to exercise with proper nutrition. And that is something that we're doing. And this is a meta-analysis because in the literature, it's always a little bit confusing whether, for example, protein supplementation increases muscle mass and strength when you're doing a lifestyle intervention. But if you put all these studies together, and this is a meta-analysis by Naomi Cermak, showing that all these studies, even though they didn't show significant results, they all favor an increase in muscle mass and also strength when you provide additional protein. Of course, the whole issue is what protein, when, distribution throughout the day, John already alluded to it. There's a lot of factors how you can make your physical activity more effective. Now, if you, for example, do this in the frail elderly, frail elderly are generally excluded from all studies because it's too difficult to work with them because they have a lot of comorbidities. You have to pick them up by car from their homes, bring them to a one-on-one -on -one training session, give them actually basically the protein in their mouth, 
uh, in short. So this study was actually one of those huge studies that took us two and a half years, and we see that only the frail elderly that were receiving additional protein in the morning and at lunch, they actually saw an increase in muscle protein synthesis and therefore an increase in muscle protein or total muscle mass. About 1.2 kilograms over six, 24 weeks. And um, the funny thing is the other group did not increase muscle mass. Now the media also to, uh, walked away with this paper saying that the exercise intervention was not successful. It's not true. They got stronger, but they didn't increase muscle mass significantly. And that is because the frail elderly consume protein around 0.8 grams per kilogram body mass per day or less, and it's not enough to sustain or to support the increase in muscle. Now, we are doing a lot of immobilization studies because most people are in for over a very short time period because most people that are hospitalized are only hospitalized for five to seven days. For example, hip surgery or back surgery or whatever. And now, the funny thing is, is what they lose is about 1.4 kilos of muscle in one week. This is a bed rest study where we actually have people feeding normally, they were not sick, no inflammation, any of that, they lost 1.4 kilograms. Now the PhD student came to me and said, look, is that a lot, 1.4 kilograms? I gave him a wallet and I said, go to the supermarket, buy some Argentinian steaks and put them on the barbecue tonight, but before you do, make a picture. And this is 1.4 kilogram of steak. This is what you lose in one week. Now, as I was presenting this picture at a, at a meeting, and then I was thinking about the study that we did before, and actually the PhD was in the audience. It took us 500,000 euros, 50 volunteers, two rental cars, 120 elderly people, and two and a half years of my life to do this study to show you that we could gain 1.2 kilograms of muscle, in six months, with one-on-one -on -one training sessions, twice a, week, twice a week, providing them two times 15 grams of protein at breakfast and at lunch, we gained 1.2 kilograms. We were happy, it was published within a few days, all good. But this is what happens if you are hospitalized because you break your hip or something else after one week. So I think John was actually swearing, I'm trying not to. You can boop up in one week what you can generate in half a year. Please consider this. One week can muck up everything you build up in six months. So that is essential and nowadays people go to the hospital and lose this and they never regenerate it. So think about it if you compare these studies. Think about how much you lose in a single week. So nowadays we believe that if you're hospitalized and you have short periods of bed rest, you can actually lose a lot of muscle that can contribute or maybe fully explain the age-related muscle loss. And that's basically the catabolic crisis model that uh, was, I think it was first published by, uh, by Douglas Penn Jones, basically saying that throughout the lifespan, especially the last two, three decades, you have these periods where you have a flu, a new hip, uh, whatever. You have a weak bed rest, you lose so much muscle, you only regain, say, 50%, and then slowly you're losing the muscle over time until you get issues. Now. Of course, that is in contrast to the concept of an age-related muscle loss that slowly happens and there's nothing to do about it. It's not the case. We always see, if you start calculating, it's really easy. You only have to be sick like that for once a year or once in two years to actually lose the muscle that we see in people over two, two years or 20 years. So if your mom or dad or grandpa or grandma comes back from the hospital after a new knee, don't put their bedroom downstairs and say, hi, hi mom, dad, we have put your bedroom downstairs to help you out so you don't have to take the stairs anymore. Put, please put their bedroom one, one story up. Because they don't recruit their type two fibers after they come back from the hospital. And they have to recruit the type two fibers into, in order to regain the muscle that they've lost in the hospital. And otherwise, it will not happen. So is this really the case in the hospital? And we've done now several studies. Yes, people lose some immense amounts of muscle. And these are the healthy people, the ones that have elective hip surgery because they want to go skiing with their grandchildren again. They lose massive amounts of muscle. If they're also malnutrition or if there's inflammation, it goes even more rapid. So you have huge amounts of muscle loss. How do we prevent it? Nutrition? Can nutrition prevent it? Now, this is already part of the, the, the debate maybe tomorrow. First of all, what do they eat? They hardly eat anything. 
even if you're healthy. These are not sick people, the people for, sur for elective surgery. This is what they get, 0.8 grams per kilogram body mass per day. We can have a discussion on that, way too little for somebody that has to re recondition that whole surgery part. But then they don't even eat it, what they get. So only after four days after surgery, they're back at 0 0.8. So they're malnutritioned, both from an energy as well as in a protein perspective. So how can you readapt or recondition or recover from surgery if you eat that little? So nutritional support is necessary. Does that mean we have to throw in all those clinical nutrition supplements? No. Proper foods may be enriched with protein or more protein-dense foods in order to maintain at least the amount of protein that they were consuming before they went into the hospital, preferably more. Second, of course, exercise. Now, the first thing that happens when you get sick or hospitalized is that you don't do any exercise anymore, and unfortunately, you actually stay in bed. Now, it's not the first time that people were thinking about other options. I don't think this will come through the FDA anymore, but there's a lot of options that you have. Simply, if you're not forbidden to go out of bed, have people just go out of bed continuously. Most hospitals don't have the money or the, or the, or the personal uh, options of helping them out of bed. So if you have the possibility, have somebody walk around. Don't, don't go and visit people in the hospital and sit next to the bed. Walk with them if it's possible, as much as possible, because then you'll have severely less muscle loss. If you're immobilized or you're in a coma or anything like that, you can't move, there's exercise memetics. Not the pills they're talking about, because if you don't know, if you know that there's 12,000 proteins being expressed, there's no pill that can do that. So don't believe in the exercise pill, but believe in alternatives of exercise. For example, electrical stimulation. We show that electrical stimulation stimulates muscle protein synthesis at a way lower level than exercise or physical activity, but it still works. And then if you apply it during an, uh, during an immobilization by putting holes in the, in the plaster cast and stimulating twice a day, you fully prevent muscle, muscle loss. So this is showing that it actually stimulates muscle protein synthesis in the stimulated leg. And this is showing that it actually prevented muscle loss. So in a week, I mean, even they, two weeks of immobilization, no muscle loss in an immobilized leg, simply by two times a day electrical stimulation. Can we apply it also during coma? This is a horrible study. We didn't figure out until we were doing the study because when people are uh, committed, admitted to the hospital in a coma after severe head trauma, because most people generally don't recover from that. But the ones that do recover have difficulty actually rehabilitating because they've lost all their muscle. So we're trying to see whether we could prevent muscle loss in a, in a comatose condition. And we stimulated one leg and we did a sham stimulation of the other leg. No muscle loss when you electrical stimulate twice a day. No muscle loss. The other leg, the control leg, massive muscle loss. And for those of you working with muscle, you hardly see changes within a week on a muscle fiber level. But when you're in coma, we can't bring you to a DEXA or CT scan. So the only thing we can do is take, take muscle biopsies. Now, imagine this, this is about a week. 20% reduction in fiber size. Normal studies can't show any change within two weeks. 20%, basically you see the people just wasting away in front of the eyes. So that's 20% of the muscle fiber just less than a week. So there's more than simply inactivity. There's probably also central neural control, uh, inflammation, all these things that actually contribute to the muscle loss. Of course, the combination is how do we maximize muscle gain or how do we lower muscle loss by using these exercise memetics and the foods in combination. Now, that is something that we're doing now also in the ICU. And bringing me to a few conclusions before uh, John starts waving that I'm past my 30 minutes. Um, protein ingestion and muscle contraction stimulate muscle protein synthesis, very straightforward. And physical activity sensitizes the muscle but physical inactivity desensitizes the muscle. So if there's anything we can do is actually modulate the physical activity to have the nutrition have an effect. Short term disuse, when you go to the hospital, everybody will tell you you're only going there for a simple procedure. Those five days, you don't need massive, massive other interventions, but understand that only a few days of disuse already induces anabolic resistance and strongly reduces muscle mass and strength. And it's quite easy to prevent it but it takes effort, like almost everything. 
also a PhD. So how do you attenuate muscle loss? Remain physically active, uh, active as, as much as possible. If it's not possible, certainly localized when you have uh, bolts or plaster cast, use exercise mimetics. Consume a more protein-dense diet. For the dietitians among us, they know how difficult it is to convince people. It's not about increasing protein intake, it's about maintaining protein intake at a lower energy intake. Does that make sense to everybody? So you reduce physical activity because hospitalization, but you have to maintain absolute levels of protein intake. That means the only way to doing that is eat more protein dense. So we're not advocating a high protein intake diet, we're advocating a more protein dense diet. And then we discussed it, but I don't have time to discuss pre-sleep feeding. We're also trying looking for the protein distribution. Distribute the protein in main meals throughout the day. Don't go grazing, but just give boluses of protein. And that's all just a thank you to some of the groups that we work with and industry that sponsors. And these people haven't seen me for a week, but I still hope that they're in Maastricht, and I still hope that they're working. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>